Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place right here in beautiful Simi Valley, California, where the weather is thankfully really nice this time of year. And um, <laughs> we're not having hurricanes or tornadoes. <laughs> you know, I lived in Oklahoma. We could always tell tornado weather. You could just tell. I was, after a year, I could tell when the tornado weather was there because the hot and the cold would start to mingle. And um, then you had tornadoes. In the summer, it was so sticky and muggy. It was like, God, how can anybody live here? And then I said, I'm living here. <laughs> but I will never live there again. <laughs> Anyways, Charlotte, welcome back. So good to see you. We missed you. <laughs> Amen. All right. Um, I want to just, I do want to say, even though he's not here, I want to say a thank you to Michael Monty. He brought us two new speakers and he showed us how that we had the one middle speaker that wasn't giving a full sound. So I'm sure, Phil, you could probably tell that a little bit today. Yeah. You could, I could hear the difference too. So, so thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right. Um, I want to, I want to start out with something kind of interesting. That's, it's not really in the notes so much. Um, but I, I, I've been meditating on it, and I thought it was interesting. I shared a little bit about it on uh, Thursday night, and so I'm going to read it to you out of Revelations 22, 1 and 2, and a, a lot of people think that Revelation is a book of confusion, that nobody can figure out what it says, and that's not true. A lot of it's pretty simple. Some of the stuff in the throne room is very interesting, and some of the end time stuff might be a little complicated, but there's a lot of stuff that's pretty, pretty easy. And so in Revelation 22, verse 1, he said, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, <clears throat> proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, so there's the street right there by the throne, the water's pouring out of it. I guess you could body surf, you know, I don't know. But. And on either side of the river there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Now I want to read that from the Passion Translation, as we did the other night. The angel showed me the river of water of life flowing from, flowing with water, clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river was the tree. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? When you think about heaven, how often do you think about rivers flowing down the middle of it? But don't we all love water? Like you want to live by the beach, you want to live by a river, you want to live by a lake. Yeah, everybody loves water because it's, it's in our DNA to love it. So it's flowing in heaven. On either side of the river was the tree of life with its 12 kinds of ripe fruit according to each month of the year. The leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. So most everybody, myself included, we talk about time versus eternity. How that there is, time is outside of eternity that God created time. But because everything else on the earth is created in relation to God's kingdom. Tom, I wonder if that humming is from the two speakers. It's just a thought. I notice they're still on. <clears throat> but if God created everything, his likeness and image, and he gave us a world that was you know, somewhat like his, Doesn't it stand to reason that there might be some kind of a revelation of time? Well, here it says that the tree of life has 12 kinds of fruit, ripening to each month of the year. Well, if there's no time in heaven, how is it ripening each month of the year? But it says for the healing of the nations, that means that it's this is connected towards the end time. That's when the nations will be healed. I don't know if that's during the millennial reign or whatever, but there has to be some semblance 
of time in heaven because of how much God is like us. And then it says, with its 12 kinds of ripe fruit. I'll read that from the, the Passion Translation. 12 manner of fruit from the King James. Well, how many months in a year do we have? We have 12 months. But if the tree of life is ripening in every month, that means that the months in heaven are somewhat in alignment with the months on earth. Or maybe, maybe a month is a trillion years, or I don't know, but, but the months seem to be, they seem to be lined up with us. Amen. Now when God created man, it said that he, well, I'll, I'll read that to you. Um, well, let me read this first. I, I actually don't need to read all of the, tw- the 12 months in the Hebrew because our months, we go by different names, but Tishri, Shehavan, Kislev, Tevet, Shavat, and there are others. These are all the months of the nation of Israel. So God creates 12 months. There are 12 tribes. And in Genesis 1, 4 and 5, it says, God, well, I don't want to read that one. I want to read 4, verse 14. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So when God created the earth, he created seasons. So we have four seasons. Now the early earth, I don't know if the seasons were the same because Christian scientists believe that when the water that was above before it came down upon the earth that it was so high in the atmosphere that it crystallized and so that the earth was all subtropical. There were no cold zones. But being that there is a rotation around the sun, you would think there were seasons where it was warmer and seasons where it was cooler. And of course, here's the interesting feel. You're going to like this part. They surmise that with the lights from all the stars and the sun, everything hitting the crystal atmosphere, the ice atmosphere that would have been up there, that it would have created music. So there would have been a continuous music flowing on the earth. I mean, how many, how many of you just sit around like with, with no noise whatsoever? <laughs> I mean, sometimes you're doing something, you're focused on, you might have the TV on in the background, the news or something like that, or maybe music. And there's always some sound, but that's the way that God created us to, have, to be in this presence of his sound. Now, we're not always in the presence of his sound anymore, but that's why, that's why you always want sound, because it's, it's actually moving you. And so the wrong sound, obviously, can move you in the wrong direction. Um, Rodney, our, our piano is tuned to 444, isn't it? Yeah. So we're tuned to 444 instead of 440. If you ever play the guitar or any instrument, they tune it to 440, but the reason they do that is because it creates a kind of a chaos within your neural system. 444 creates a peace of God. And so a lot of people don't know that, so no matter who you're listening to, a lot of times there's that little bit of, you know, eh, it's, it's hitting you. So God creates this amazing earth, and he gives us a rotation, and he says, that's a year. So God created time, but it's, in, it's kind of in connection with his realm. I don't know if he counts years there, but if the, if the trees are giving different fruit every month, and there's 12 seasons, 12 months, that means there's something like that. And then when God creates the earth, he creates it in, Six days, and he rests on the seventh day. He calls the morning and the evening a day. And then he takes a day off. He rests. And we, we have that number, seven. It's the number of rest. We know that there will be a millennial reign, which if you go back from Adam to now, we're somewhere around 6,000 years, not quite. According to the Jewish calendar, it's like 57, 83, or 87. So we're like 213 years away from where, from where you would be to, that, to the end of the sixth day, if a day with the Lord is a thousand years. But we know that the actual days that he created the earth in 
were morning and evening. So he didn't create them over a thousand years, six thousand years. He created them in actual days as we know it. And so the morning, which is the beginning of a day, you're energized, you're ready to go, everything's new. But the evening, the mellowness of the day, and in heaven, as we talked about the other night, Rebecca Spring in her book, Within Heaven's Gates, talked about there wasn't a night, but there was a mellowing in the evening. There was like a mellowing and people rested. And so the evening for us or the night for us is a time to rest, rejuvenate, and restore. It's a time when, it's a time when your body and your soul, your spirit, they, you lay down and God kind of deals with you and refreshes you over the night and you wake up with a new creativity and a new perspective. So the night is not wicked. It's not evil. There is evil darkness the Bible talks about, but it's not the kind of darkness that we have. What does that have to do with anything? I don't really know. No. No. I think what it has to do is that being that we're created in God's image and His likeness, our way of living is much more connected to His kingdom than we realize. And modern cities, though they may be somewhat ugly, are based on heaven cities, the cities of heaven. I don't believe there's only one city in heaven. How do you know that, Bob? I don't know. But you don't know either. We know there's at least one city, 1,500 miles square. So it's unique in that it's, it's as high as it is long and wide. So, and, and I, I remember reading a book of somebody that, that saw the long and the wide of it, you know, and went up into the height of the heavens, of the city. But a lot of people, because they're, because they're either making it up, <laughs> all went to heaven and they're making it up, or I don't know, they just didn't see it. But it is, it is that kind of a city. It's something unique. Now, not everybody that says they've gone to heaven has gone to heaven. I'll just tell you that right now. So, always follow the word. Put the word over, you know, when the word of God says something about heaven, trust that. And um, there may be some people that you trust um, that have gone to heaven. That's fine because, you know, you've, you've, you've challenged, challenged their doctrines and so on. And you say, no, that's real. All right. All um, right. I'm going to continue on where we left off the other day, or Thursday night, and we were talking about the hybrid gospel, the liberty or bondage, and really we dealt a lot with bondage, how we're not going back in, not, not, that, we're, not that we're teaching some doctrine of bondage, hey, we have a bondage church, you want to go there? <laughs> Nothing weird like that. Um, you may be a little bit weird, but your doctrines are not. So... Um, <clears throat> He's talking about not going back into slavery or bondage, and that's what was happening to the Galatian church. When you try to go back to the law, you're going back to a system that is no longer viable. And it was not even fully, it was, it was viable for the people at the time, but they could not keep it. They couldn't keep the law. So they had to bring sacrifice offerings, and then the high priest went in once a year, and their sins were covered for the year. But they were in bondage to sin. And that's what we talked about in John 8. They were in bondage to sin. But we're not in bondage to sin. Amen. And then I heard, I was listening to uh, Kat Kerr, Elijah's dreams, and there was a question. And the question was, uh, Kat says that she does not sin. <laughs> you know, most people have such a sin consciousness. When I listened to the question, I knew where this person was coming from. They're like, I sin every day. It's like a, it's like a mindset. Oh yeah, I, 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 I sin every day. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That kind of a mindset. Well, I was a sinner, but I was saved by grace. Therefore, I'm no longer a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Bob, what if you sin? It doesn't change who I am. If I willfully disobey God, that is a, that is a sin, but 
I don't willfully disobey God. And the Bible says in 1 John 3, 9 that I cannot sin because I'm born of God. In other words, the seed of Christ in me cannot sin. Now, I don't want to go over that too much because we went over that the other night. So in Romans 8... He said, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry of a father. So the spirit that was of Adam, which again, I'm not going to go over everything we have over Thursday, was a spirit of bondage, but the spirit that you have is a spirit of adoption. Your born again spirit is father. He cries, father. It's a spirit of adoption. We've been adopted into the kingdom. In the 21st verse, he says, the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. What do the children of God have? Glorious liberty. So the creature itself is going to be delivered from bondage or the corruption to the glorious liberty of the children of God. We have a glorious liberty and we have a sin consciousness. But we're supposed to have a righteousness consciousness. We're supposed to be conscious and aware of our right standing with God and not conscious about sin. If you're always conscious about sin, you're going to sin. But if you're conscious of your righteousness, you're going to walk towards the throne. You're going to walk toward the kingdom, toward the blessings. Most Christians that I know, they're not looking for a way to sin. They're trying to get closer to God. They're trying to hear His voice. They're praying. They're trying to receive things from the, from the kingdom of God. They're not looking for a way to sin. And somebody who's looking for a way to sin, did they actually get saved? Did they, did they actually have an experience with Jesus Christ where He's now part of their heart and transformed them? I'm not sure. All right. So let's move on. So Paul, going back to Galatians, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares who brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. So Paul said they had the liberty already. He said that they might bring us into bondage. So he's talking about here in Galatians they were trying to spy our liberty to bring us back into bondage. Now, whether they knew they were doing that or not, I don't know. But why would someone try to bring you into bondage? What, what, what does one person get out of putting another person in bondage? It's slavery. They get slaves. The Holy Roman Empire and the Catholic Church of that time basically used the people as financiers for everything they did. They were basically slaves. And you know the story of Martin Luther when John Tetzel was sent by Pope Leo X to collect indulgences, which is a lot of the 95 Theses was against the indulgences. And so the people would put their money and he said, and, and Tetzel, I can't remember the exact quote, but it was like a little lyric or rhyme, you know, when the coin hits the bottom of the thing, your relatives are freed. You know, they're freed from purgatory. They weren't in hell, but they were in purgatory, which is a made-up place. If you ask somebody, in the, as a, show, can you show me purgatory in the Bible? Sorry, can't show you what's not there. I can show you Abraham's bosom, but nobody's there anymore. It's been vacated. So Paul goes on to say this. They, they wanted to take us out of liberty into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he said, we did not allow them to bring us into this gospel. And I'll tell you something. If somebody's really stern and they're really strong about a bondage thing, they, they come at you with an accusation. Well, if you're a Christian, you wouldn't do that. You know, they come at you with accusation. And it puts you on a defensive. And when you're on the defensive, you're not on the offense. Well, Bob, what do you do if somebody accuses you? Well, what happens a lot of times, we try to defend ourselves. Well, no, I'm not like that. You know, and, 
And here's the problem. When you defend yourself with your righteousness, you put yourself into their realm. You put yourself under the law. You put yourself under legalism. Somebody accused me, well, you're not, you're, you're not living the right Christian life. And whatever I say, I would say, well, the only person who could tell me something like that would be somebody who's a believer. I'm a believer. Oh, well, good. Let's speak in tongues together. Shukamaha, yalaki, aloma. They start freaking out. Say, they start going like that. Say, don't worry, I'll cast that devil out of you. That's the first sign of a believer. I was talking, I was talking to this woman once. Bob, do you do crazy stuff like that? Sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes demons manifest. I was talking to this one woman, and, and she really liked a lot of things that, that we were saying, and um, but she was really had an issue with tongues, so I was showing her through the scripture. She goes, and then um, and I did a little bit of praying in tongues. She goes, oh, I feel something wrong about that. I said, that's not you. That's just the devil in you. That's just the devil that's with you. I go, there's a devil that's keeping you. I go, look, the scriptures are all very clear. So what would be opposed to all the truth in the scriptures? It could only be a demon. So you're thinking that it's something in you that's holy, but it's actually a feeling of a demon when it hears the sound of God that's making you anxious. Come out! Okay. <clears throat> By the way, we did, a, we did a thing the other day. I did a thing with AJ. I kind of interviewed him because um, he was taking the trains, and he had a, a couple of really unique experiences where people were demonized. So it's on, it's, I think it's on our YouTube, and I, I'm sure it's on our, our site, and I know it's on the Facebook, because um, I looked at it. It wasn't titled at first, but I titled it, and I, a lot more people are starting to look at it, but it, it's how he had issues on the train, and then, what was the one person like dressed like a bat and climbing the pole, and, and, then, and it was great how this person, they were like, they were ready to like a, attack him because he had bound the spirit, and they couldn't do it, and they freaked out, went to the other side of the train, and then they were going to attack him, and he said his first thought, you know, he started going to that martial arts thing, and it's true, you, you know, if you've been trained, you kind of start to go like that way, but then he said the Holy Spirit just quickened him, no, and he went back into the spirit, and he just bound that thing, and that guy looked like he was charging him, but then he just stopped. Anyways, listen, that's a great testimony. I think you'll love it. And if you ride the trains, not only will you love it, you will need it. <laughs> okay, so let's move on here. So even so, when we were children, <clears throat> we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you're sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, I'm a father. Felt like we just read that. Maybe we did. So let's move on. But now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements wherein you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. Bob, you just taught on that. <laughs> I'm afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So he said they were returning <clears throat> to the beggarly elements. What does he mean by that? They were following ceremonies. Okay, on this day we got to that. And, and even the Sabbath. Like, Bob, shouldn't we keep the Sabbath? No. You know, but there's whole, there's whole denominations that are Sabbath keepers, and if you don't keep the Sabbath, you've sinned, and you're probably going to go to hell. I mean, I've heard, I've heard anointed men of God talk about how we should be keeping all the old Jewish um, um, hol hol holy days. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I'm going to be honest, too. Whenever I see people going into that kind of a mindset, it, it's usually on a matter of time till they come under the bondage of it. Like this one guy, we got him delivered from, from, from some demons, some nasty demons. And he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And he was moving with God. And he was growing, starting to hear the voice of God. And one day I see him coming in with a yarmulke. I'm saying, I didn't know you were Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not. I'm not. You know, I just, I, but I, I, well, you don't need to wear that. And then I had these, these other ladies, they, they, they came in, they took their shoes off. They were members here, and they sa I said, uh, what are you taking your shoes off for? Well, we were in uh, this meeting, you know, Sandu, whatever his name is. Uh, 
a Christian uh, Indian guy, and um, probably a good guy, probably a really good guy. And, um, and, and so, you know, we, we took off our shoes. I go, uh, well, unless the Lord tells us, unless the Holy Spirit tells us, you don't need, you don't need to take your shoes off. I go, we don't have all those kinds of ceremonies. We might have certain somewhat agendas, but we have to be open to the agenda of the Lord. Take off your shoes. I go, listen, people don't want to smell your feet. Put your shoes down. <laughs> it's not, it's not, um, it's funny how Christians create all these things that can end up being bondages. Now, maybe the Holy Spirit at that conference they were at told everybody to take their shoes off. Now, that's possible. And if he did, great. You know, and, and so maybe that's it. I go, but if the Holy Spirit's not saying it, we're not under the law. We're under the Holy Spirit. Now, there was a, there was a prophet... She was a prophet in our church when we were a very young church, our very first church. And she really had a, a, a pretty good word in her mouth. Like she really had a pretty good word of knowledge. Um, not always wisdom, but she had a good word of knowledge. And she had an anointing. And so she would get up and speak until the anointing hit. Then she'd just start prophesying to people. And, and it, was, it was very anointed. Um, it was amazing. It was really the accuracy that, that she operated in. And I was helping her do a meeting, and I was kind of like emceeing it, helping out, that kind of stuff. And um, at the meeting, she, she pulls out this vial of oil, and she goes, because she, she'd always, when she'd feel the spirit, she'd always go, ooh, ooh. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm not really one of those kind of people that do that, but I, I, I respect those that do, and as long as they don't do it too much. <laughs> what do they do it too much? I start laughing. That's the problem. She goes, everyone that smells this oil, the power of God's going to hit them. And I, in my mind, you know, because your mind's not always where your spirit is, my mind was like, I don't think so, you know. <laughs> but she's doing it, all these people, and I thought, oh, it's all psychosomatic, and, you know, and they're all falling out. And I'm helping to catch them and everything else. So she goes, your turn. To <laughs> I was on the floor for 45 minutes. So when the Spirit says something, then it's of the Spirit, then it has, a, it has a relevance and a revelation. I was literally on the floor 45 minutes, and the waves of glory were washing over me, and it was getting stronger and stronger. So that's an experience with God that cannot be discounted, that affects you forever. But these, what Paul is saying is, don't get caught up in these old ceremonies that they don't have meaning. In other words, they don't have anointing. They might have had significance in showing and revealing the coming of Christ, the different ceremonies, the different meals, they might have relevance. But now, not so much. I'm pretty sure Paul wasn't out there teaching the Gentiles how to follow all the Jewish traditions. All right, now, let's move on to another mindset. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And, and when I say another mindset, we're back into Galatians 5, where we started. So he said, if you're circumcised or you're following the law, Christ doesn't profit, you have no profit. In other words, you have negated everything that God has given. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law which you know nobody can keep. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Well, what does the word justified mean? He's being made righteous. So if you are being made righteous by the law, you are fallen from grace. In other words, the righteousness isn't coming from grace, it's coming from your own soul, it's coming from your own works, and it cannot work. Only the righteousness of Christ can work. You know, the amazing thing in communion, when he says, you have to judge yourself, he actually says, you have to judge the body of Christ. When we judge ourselves in communion, you don't take your soul and judge your soul by your soul, according to some kind of a law. 
I mean, you could look and say, well, I could be nicer to people. I could be, the, you know. What he's saying is you have to look at Christ and say, is he my righteousness? Is he, am I believing in Christ for my salvation or myself? If you're believing in yourself, then you're trying to make yourself perfect. But if you're believing in Christ, you recognize that he is the perfect. It's like it says in Romans 8, 29, and that was after talking about the groanings, that we are, that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Everything that has to do with the Word of God and with the Holy Spirit is to bring you into the likeness and the image of God. But Bob, I'm... I'm. And here's the thing. You know, my, my, my kids mostly grew up in the Northridge Church, which was a big church. And in the big church, you have a lot of wonderful people and you have a lot of real nuts. <laughs> I mean... Serious nuts. <laughs> what do you do with people like that, Bob? You keep preaching the word, teaching them to pray in the spirit, and a lot of times a lot of that nuttiness will start to leave them. But when they first come in, they might have a lot of that. And your kids, which are little, they see that. <laughs> and they have a hard time remembering all the wonderful people. And so I have to remind them, well, remember so-and-so, remember so-and-so. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Remember the guy who was the captain of the police? You know, he was the, the head of the police in L.A. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a great guy. I love that guy, you know. Well, I said there, there were probably more people like that, but, but because you were my kids, the nuts would come up and they would ask you questions. <laughs> well, how old are you, David? <laughs> Eight? That's a weird number in the Bible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, how do you fix people who are broken? Well, God fixes them. How does He fix them? Through His Word and through His Spirit. By spending time in the Word and the Spirit and, and honestly spending time around you. Thankfully, we have no nuts in here. Maybe like two, but other than that, I mean. If you're sitting there going, am I one of the nuts? Yeah. <laughs> no. Now, what if, what if somebody was broken? Or what if somebody had issues? What do you do? Love them. Let them spend time with you. Let them see how you operate. Pray, you know, pray together. And, and let them pray with you. you know, I, I value my own time. I do too. But I pray with people because that's how people learn how to pray. We pray together and we become a unit. And that transforms people because the presence of God transforms them into what? Into the image of Christ that they were meant to be. Whatever you were fully meant to be, the image of Christ in you will bring that out. And you might, have, you might be meant to be a lot of things. You might have certain creative gifts. You might have singing gifts, or you might be able to put, you know, play instruments. You might have a love for it, but something happened in your brain and you can't mathematically compute. You know, people that play instruments are pretty good in math because it's pretty mathematical. And so maybe you have a gift of music, but there was something, something was broken in your brain because of uh, when you were born, something in the DNA, and God can fix that. No, he, he can't fix that. And I'll tell you a story. If any of you have ever uh, listened to Ian Clayton when he was here, and he hasn't been here in a couple of years because of the whole outbreak, but if you've listened to him, you go, that guy is just a dead genius. Like, I can't even keep up with him. And, um, and people go out with a lot of questions, and I've asked Ian, every, he's answered every question I've ever asked him. But he was dyslexic. He had a lot of issues. But as he learned to separate his soul from his spirit and to move and to step into the kingdom realm. He was able to actually change his physical brain. He was able to go into his brain and move things around, and now his brain functions like, like a genius. 
Like he, he actually goes to some of these conferences where these people are geniuses and he's right there with them, sometimes further than them. Geometry and all this kind of stuff. So we, we, can, fix, we can fix our brain. Listen, the deficiencies within us come from the DNA of Adam. But we now have the DNA of Christ and we can actually affect our abilities through the DNA of Christ. It really depends how much you want to do it. But ultimately, our ultimate goal as we walk day by day is to be transformed to the image of His Son. Now, that's not the message today, but that is the ultimate goal. So, so every, every day we're praying, every day we're in the Word, we're transforming. But if we're transforming to the image of His Son, what are we changing to? We're not apologizing for everything we've ever done in life. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, you know. Jesus didn't apologize for everything he said, and he made people really mad. Like, no, I mean, Jesus made people really mad. Yeah. Bob sounds like you. No. <laughs> In my younger days, I used to make people really mad, but that's why, that's why we had such a big church, because people like being mad at somebody, and I was really a good candidate for that. <laughs> Jesus said things that really upset people. He overturned their doctrines. And they tried to throw him off a cliff. They wanted to kill him. He heals the man with a withered hand. What happens? They said they went out to find out how they could kill him. What? And they didn't embrace him, invite him to their church and hold a couple week revival meeting or something? <laughs> no, they said, how are we going to kill this guy? Why? Because he was taking their people out of bondage. He was taking their, and when you take their people out of bondage, what are you doing? You're taking them out of the slavery. And what happens when people that are your slaves are no longer your slaves? All the profit you get from them is gone. I'll say this. There's a slavery that the people of the nations of the world are about to be delivered from. Keep your, just keep your eyes open. You will see it. Yes. All right, let's move on. Fifth verse. Oops. I'm going to have to... I forgot to put this note in here. I'm going to have to take you... to Romans... Because he talks about falling from grace. And we're going to go ahead and read the first four verses, or five verses. What shall we say that Abraham, our father, is pertaining to the flesh is found? Well, nothing. Nobody's justified by their works or by their flesh. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory. But isn't that what James said in the book of James? Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith. Uh, <clears throat> He goes, show me your faith by your grace. I'll show you my faith by my works. How could James be so far wrong? Like, not kind of wrong, like really wrong. How could he make the most reprehensible statement in the entire Bible? In Acts 15. Because, even though he was a half-brother of Jesus... He grew up under the law. When Jesus was walking the earth, he and his other family members said, yeah, he's crazy. But, you know, they got transformed. And I'm not saying that James was an unholy person. He was a righteous man. He was a holy man. And he at one time became the lead apostle to the church of Jerusalem. But the problem was it was the church of Jerusalem. You know, Peter was called to the Jews. Paul was called to the Gentiles. And so when Peter went to the Gentiles, he backslid. And he went under the law in Galatians 2, and Paul had to correct him. When Paul went back to the Jews, he backslid. He went into the temple and shaved his head. Now, he, Paul says this, I become all things to all men. And so I realized he was doing that to the Jews. He was honoring their way so he could preach the gospel to them. But he would not allow, was it Titus or Timothy, to be circumcised. He would not allow them to come under the law. But it didn't fare well for him when he was in that situation. So James 
is the apostle now to the church of Jerusalem. And he probably, I, I understand why he said what he said. Because there's just some Christians that are just, they're not going to do anything. That's so why he's going, well, if you want to show me you have faith, I need to see your works. And that's, that's kind of a fair point, but that's all it is. It should never be a doctrine. And Paul is showing this. He said, if Abraham were justified by works, he is whereof to glory, but not before God. But James says, well, Abraham offered up his son Isaac, and therefore he was justified not only by faith, but by his works. But Paul says he wasn't justified by his works. So let's read on. Since I opened that little can of worms. I know you know the answers, but somebody here listening or watching may not know. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God was counted to him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. That's the exact same scripture that James quotes. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not his works. And I'm going to show you more scriptures that faith or that righteousness can only be achieved by faith. Now, since we're here, I guess we could read on a little. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, who were the two people that were called the father of Jesus in the, in the flesh realm? David. David and Abraham, both counted as righteousness. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Well, that would kind of mess up the faith without works thing because if it was counted before he was circumcised, that's before he offered up Isaac. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Okay, it's really boring, I realize that. So let's go. Let me draw you a picture. That helps. All right. What was that picture for? For nothing. No, Bob, everything has to have a reason. Does it? Does everything have to have a reason? No, some things are just fun. That's why people think Christians are boring and they're, 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 they're like so ultra serious. Is that a beer you're sipping? apple cider <laughs> Bob do you ever sip beers only when I want to throw up <laughs> I'm a very strange Irishman I don't like any alcohol of any kind but you, you want to do what Paul said take some wine for your stomach's sake my stomach's fine so I don't need any wine and don't use that to justify you know getting drunk all right Galatians 5.5 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Isn't that, isn't that the new? What is the new? The two elements of the new? Righteousness and the Spirit. So we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Remember, Old Testament, meditate therein day and night. Joshua 1.8 this book of the law. Meditate there in day and night. We're not in the old. So we don't meditate in the book of the law day and night. That doesn't mean we don't meditate on scripture, on the word of God. That's obviously awesome. But what he's saying is the spirit is the one who leads you. That we are of the spirit and of righteousness. 
Let me tell you, let me tell you another story. If all you did was pray in the Holy Spirit and you never had a Bible, I don't believe that you would be duped into false doctrines. So a friend of ours, I haven't seen him some years, but he preached for me a couple times and we prayed for people together. Talk about healing and anointing. And um, <clears throat> literally I was asked to go with him by a guy in the Hollywood thing. He goes, hey, can you come tonight and, and meet with Charlie Sheen? And um, he goes, you and Tipsu. And I said, no, tonight's Saturday. I got church tomorrow. I said, I, I'm not going to go waste my time on that bum. <laughs> I'm praying for the members of our congregation. They're way more value to me than he is. All right, so maybe that wasn't the smartest thing. <laughs> but Tipsu did go and pray for him, and he got healed. And the thing was, I had a dream about Charlie Sheen where I saw his shoulder um, was messed up, and I prayed for his shoulder. Anyways, he had a messed up shoulder, and I was supposed to go pray, and I didn't um, because I was a little too judgy in the flesh. <laughs> and probably I could have mentored him better maybe than the guy from Sri Lanka. But <clears throat> that's just a story. So this guy, Tipsu, he is dying of a brain tumor in Sri Lanka. Several of his family members had died. Some witch doctor had cursed them. His cancerous brain tumor. And his brother-in-law comes to him and said, hey, there's an evangelist preaching about Jesus. And he tried every... He prayed to Mohammed. He prayed to the Hindu, all the Hindu gods. And and um, nothing. He was going to die. And he goes, there's evangelists preaching about Jesus and people are being healed. So he went there and he got healed. And he got saved. And he got filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. Uh, so he started having the meetings. People were coming together and they would, they would pray together and they would meet together. And then he would, he would pray for them to be healed. He didn't have a Bible. But he, he was healed, you know, he would just tell them about Jesus, he was healed, and Jesus heals. And then people would be healed. And then um, he said he was praying in the Holy Spirit. One day he heard this word from the Lord. Tell the people that by the stripes of Jesus they are healed. That's your covenant scripture, my friends. If you only knew one healing scripture, that's all you need to know is that one. That is the covenant healing scripture. Who his own self bear my sins and his own body on the tree that I've been dead to sin should live unto righteousness. righteousness. By whose stripes he were healed. So he went, he went into the meeting and said, everybody listen. I want you to know that by the stripes of Jesus you are healed. <laughs> no Bible, nothing. I started praying for people. Did everybody get healed? No, not everybody, but he said, he said sometimes if people wouldn't get healed, they'd fast and pray until they did. He said, good thing you don't live in America, they'd all be dead. <clears throat> <laughs> the first time we met, I had, I had done a 14-day fast, which I don't really recommend, and um, I lost like 50 pounds or something, and but, you know, I had never met him, and he looked at me, and, he, and he, this guy fasted so much, and he was, he was thin. He goes, you, just, you were just on a long fast, weren't you? He could tell. He could tell the difference just if you're thin or you're on a long fast. That's how much this guy fasted. And um, so the Lord told him, go to Christ for the nations. I think, I'm not sure if he told him or he had a dream, and he saw himself in front of Frida Lindsay, which is Gordon Lindsay's wife and the head of Christ for the nations, at that time. Why are you telling the story? I know you guys look bored, so I'm going <laughs> to... No. By the Holy Spirit. So he gets a ticket, and he goes to Christ for the nations, but he doesn't speak English at all. And as he's on the campus, when he gets on the campus of Christ for the nations, he sees a fireball coming from heaven and it comes down and it hits him in the chest. And when it did, he could suddenly speak English. Like, I'm still working on speaking English. 
This guy did it in a minute. Uh, so he went, into, um, he went into the offices, and Frida Lindsay was in there, and she goes, I know who you are. I saw you in a dream. I'm giving you full tuition, because he didn't have any money. So that's how he, that's how he started out. That's the spirit. He didn't even have the scripture. What did he have? He had the Holy Spirit and righteousness. So that is the new. And, and I, will, I will sneak that thought in every chance and through every scripture I can find until we fully have it. Now, let's look at this. So in Hebrews 11, in the first verse, he's saying, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not things... So he begins to talk about faith, and he says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. But Bob, he did works. Well, he did works of the Spirit. I'm not saying we don't do works, but the works are Ephesians 2.10. They come from your nature. By grace you save through faith that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So he did the works of the Spirit, even though he was not filled with the Spirit, but he had no law because there was no law. So what did he do? He obeyed, the, he obeyed the voice of God. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Isn't that what we're striving to do all the time, is to obey the voice of God? So he prepared this ark, Condemned the world because he revealed that God was real by his obedience. He became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Paul's making a point here that righteousness comes by faith. He started it in the book of Romans. But it's the righteousness which comes by faith. And he said Noah was an heir of that. So it goes back to the days of Noah. We're talking before Abraham. And then in Romans 3, I thought we were in Galatians. We are, but we're just shifting. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon them that believe, for there's no difference. So anytime you get in this, you get a hankering to, um, to do something. I've got to do something different. I've got to do something for God. I'm not doing anything. I've got to do something for God. Believe. Believe. Have faith. God, Bob, Bob, God's not speaking to me. What's the last thing he said to you? I don't remember. Well, then why would he tell you something else if you don't remember the last thing he said? If you're talking to your wife and she says something to you and you walk out five minutes later and she goes, why didn't you do that? And he goes, what? I just told you five minutes ago. What did you tell? <laughs> that means you weren't listening. <laughs> Or that it didn't mean anything. You know why sometimes it seems difficult to hear the voice of God? Because you have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And God wants to make sure that when he... Because when he speaks, there's consequence for not listening. He wants to make sure that you listen and you're like, I want to do that. So that you just don't like blow it in one ear and out the other and go, oh well. And then you forget it. He wants us to know. He wants us to hear. In Romans 4, Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, upon the uncircumcision, for we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. I know we just read that, but read it again because it's in the notes. Philippians. Yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. When Paul said he suffered the loss of all things, he left everything, everything he owned, everything he had, everything he was raised up in. He was being groomed in the Jewish religion to be a leader. He said he was better than all his contemporaries. He studied harder. He worked harder. Paul was a scholar of scholars. You know who didn't write most of the New Testament? 
Peter. You know who else didn't write most of the New Testament? John. Now, John did write a couple of books, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Gospel of John. But the majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. The Gospels, Matthew and Luke, who walked with Jesus, they took Mark's Gospel and they used that as notes to write their Gospel. Now, there are differences in them, but that's why they're called the Synoptic Gospels. And without John's Gospel, you wouldn't know that Jesus walked the earth, I should say, walked as the Messiah to them for three and a half years. You would only know his year. So the majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. And Paul was a scholar of scholars. Even Peter said, he goes, Paul says things that are hard to understand, but it's scripture. Now, if you've ever done a lot of memorization, which I have, and I remember when I was memorizing, sometimes I'd be memorizing or reading things in the Old Testament and things I'd memorized in the New Testament, I'd go, hey, you stole that from here. <laughs> I would say to Paul, I would talk to Paul, we would have a conversation. Hey, you stole that from here. But he did. And I used to think that Jesus stole a lot of stuff from Proverbs. <laughs> but ultimately, since he's the word of God, he's the author. So most of Paul's letters are explaining the Old Testament and what it actually meant. He brings the new from the old. Anytime you see it is written or anything like that, he brings the new from the old. And so he was a scholar of scholars. He had a lot to lose. And he said this, and, and he goes, and to be found in him. Everybody say in him. Yeah. Remember we did the series on being in Christ? So in him, being found in him, not having my own righteousness. Man, that's hard. Especially if somebody says something to me that challenges my integrity or my uprightness, my personal integrity, my personal uprightness. How dare they? You know, or, or, you know, you want to defend yourself, right? That's a natural human response. But it's one of the most dangerous things you can ever do. Because when you defend yourself, now I'm, I'm not saying if you're in court you don't defend yourself, but, or if somebody says, you stole my purse, well, no, I didn't, you know, you could say that, but if somebody says, you are this kind of a person, well, that's your opinion, but you say, I am not, I am, and you start to defend yourself. Well, and your defense might be right, you might be right. You might defend yourself really well. You might make them look really stupid. But in the process, you have, you have defended yourself based on your own righteousness. Now here's a problem with that. And it's going to be in the fifth verse, or the sixth verse of the fifth chapter of Galatians. Here's the problem with defending yourself on your own righteousness. That now you have the right to judge other people based on your righteousness instead of on your love. I mean, Jesus, he should have said to the 11, hey, see this guy Judas? He's going to betray me tonight. You guys need to take care of him for me. But he didn't do that. Peter arrogantly said, Tonight, all, he goes, Jesus said, tonight, all of you, you're going to betray me. You're going to reject me. Peter said, these bums might, but I, and he did, literally said, he goes, he goes, I will not. He literally defied Jesus to his face. Why did he do that? Because it was Peter's righteousness. Like, no, I'm not that kind of a person. My righteousness says, I will stand by you. I will defend you even if I have to die. Peter, Peter's own righteousness caused him to speak directly against the word of God, which was tonight, all of you, all of you. 
And so you know what happened? <laughs> Even after three and a half years, every miracle, raising of the dead, words of knowledge, everything they saw, after all that, the other 11 said, we're with Peter. None of us will deny you. Can you believe that? Jesus told them what they're going to do, and that, but they went, they went for the word of Peter. That, tell, that tells you how powerful it is to defend yourself by your own righteousness. How scary it is. So he said, well, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. He denies him three times, and it, then it sunk in. He hears, he, hears, he hears the cock crowing, and all of a sudden he's like, <gasps> and it sinks in. Judas Iscariot, after he betrayed Christ, and realized what he had done. He was more arrogant than Peter. That's an amazing thing. We're so arrogant in our own righteousness, but he was more arrogant than Peter. To pay for his sins, he went and hanged himself. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Because couldn't it have been easy for Peter to go and hang himself? And you know where he would be right now if he had done that? He'd be right next to Judas. You know where Judas would be if he had done what Peter did? He would he had been one of the twelve. No, the scripture said that you know, it had been better he was never born. That's right, it did say that, and so he didn't. But out of his arrogance, he paid for his own sins. And because he paid for his own sins, he, to me, is the worst judged person in all of creation. There's no greater judgment against anyone than Judas Iscariot. But Peter would have been right there with him because Peter literally, literally stood against the word of God and said, though all they may deny you, I will not deny you. And persuaded them. That's pretty bold, right? What was that? That was Peter's will. That was Peter's own righteousness. Be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Listen to this last line. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That's what you have. The righteousness which is of God by faith. That gives you perfect access. So let's say you're going through a day and you go, ah, I meant to pray more today. I meant to do this. I meant to do that. And I didn't. What do you do? You start to condemn yourself. You start to say, what's wrong with me? And you start to judge yourself. Instead of just saying, ah, the Lord is with me. I'm in Christ Jesus. And you start praying right there. You start worshiping, praying, reading, whatever you need to do to be in Christ, to do what he wants. All right. Now, we're going to get to Galatians 5, 6, which I told you. Today might be a slightly shorter message because I hate heaters. <laughs> it really is the truth. In Galatians 5, 6, it says, For in Jesus Christ... Neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. Now here's, here's the real key about when you, when you stop judging yourself by your own righteousness. Remember, it says, it says in, in Corinthians, that's why people die. Because they receive the communion the wrong way. Communion is a lot different than people think. They don't judge the body of Christ. They don't judge that their everything that's anything that's any good is through the body of Christ and not through our own perfection. And so what's left? Thank you. You know, I found I've found over the last few years I'm doing a lot more thank you than I've ever done. 
You know, you're young and you're ambitious. Yeah, and you're lying. Blah, blah, blah. Great. Great. You just don't thank God as much. But the more you grow, the more thankful you become. Because you see, you see all of the different things in life and you just become grateful for everything. You become thankful for everything. Sometimes when we go through trials and tribulations, if you come out with thanksgiving, you've won. When you look at the body of Christ and you say, he's my everything, he's my righteousness, I'm not my own righteousness. No matter how hard I try, I'm never going to be good enough. He's my good enough. When you, rec when you truly, genuinely recognize that, then you look at somebody else in the body of Christ, you know what? You stop looking at them through the eyes of what they've done wrong. You start looking at them through the eyes of His righteousness in them. Faith which works by love. Now the love of God is in us. So when you look at somebody and you say, the Christ that loves me loves them. It changes the way you look at every single person. I can genuinely say this. <clears throat> that through Christ, there's nobody on earth that I hate. And I'm including Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> I couldn't help that cheap joke. <laughs> I don't hate anybody. And I don't want to hate anybody because hate, hate drums up the wrong things within you. It's the wrong thing to have. So your faith works by love. And, and, and Love is what? Love is, is recognizing the, the grace that's been given to you, recognizing the promises that have been given to you. Bob, I, I struggle with healing. That's because you're not letting God love you enough. Now, I, I know I said this a couple months ago, but it's true. Healing really doesn't have that much to do with healing. It has to do with righteousness. When you accept God's righteousness, the healing comes with it. So when somebody's praying for the healing, you might be praying for a healing, and that's, that's good, and meditating on healing scriptures, but it's accepting the righteousness of God that allows the healing to come. So it's not so much a healing problem as a righteousness problem. Why do you think, why do you think we start out with those first three scriptures? Isaiah 53. This is all about him forgiving our iniquities, about him carrying our afflictions, our pains, our sickness, our disease. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, inflicted, but he was wounded. He was wounded for my transgressions. It's all about what he's doing for me. And then in Matthew 8, it's just literally Jesus himself doing it on the earth that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by Isaiah the prophet. He took our infirmities, bear our sins. And then you go to 1 Peter, which we call the covenant scripture. It's the same as Isaiah. It's basically Isaiah 53. But it's modernized or brought into that time after the resurrection saying, he took my sins in his body on the cross that I being dead to sin should live under righteousness. In other words, <clears throat> he took my sins. He gave me his righteousness so that by his stripes I'm healed. So the healing is actually a byproduct of the righteousness. It's the same, and even, even David recognized this in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless the Holy Name, bless the Lord, O my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my... What? Those are right next to each other? Who forgives all my iniquities, who heals all my diseases. I know it's not the first time we've said this in here. It's like only the hundredth time, but sometimes you need to layer something so we get it. Just like the man let down on the roof. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Not son, you're healed. Thy sins be forgiven thee. So you know I have power to forgive sin? Take up your bed and walk. 
It's not a healing problem. It's a righteousness problem. You get the righteousness, you get the healing. But faith works, but, but I, need to, I need to obtain righteousness by faith, but faith works by love. You have to understand, God is love. If God says, get up, that's love saying, get up. If God says, your name is, that's love. Everything that flows from God is love. Every word that comes from his mouth is love. You know, in, in, in Proverbs 8, wisdom says, wisdom speaking says, there's nothing froward or perverse in my mouth. Well, neither in the mouth of the Lord. So every word that comes out of his mouth is love. But God's hardest adventure or God's hardest task is to somehow make us believe that he loves us. So difficult for him to make you know that he loves you. We're like Peter. Peter thought he loved Jesus. Jesus was loving Peter by not allowing him to intervene. Peter thought he was loving Jesus by intervening, but Peter was just, he was puffed up in his own pride and puffed up in his own righteousness. Jesus, in not allowing him to save him, loved him. He said, Peter, I'm going to paraphrase this, Peter, you need to allow me to love you. And to do that, you can't save me. Now, Peter was a hard case. He was a tough nut, rough fisherman. So they come out there. And Malchus, a servant of the high priest, he's his spokesman. 700 soldiers. And he said, who is Jesus? Now, I guess he didn't know who he was. But Judas betrayed him with a kiss, but he said, who is Je- where is Jesus? He said, here I am. All his people went down. Two times. Now remember, they had two swords. Peter, of course, had one of them. <laughs> he, he took out the sword and he said, Samson, this is my knight. It was all about Peter. And he just, he, he started swinging and I think he was trying to chop that guy's head off and the guy probably moved and it just cut his ear off. And Jesus stops him, say, if my kingdom were of this world, then I would ask the people to fight. I could ask for 12 legions of angels. And he lays his hands on Malchus, the, the main guy who came to take him, and he heals him. The guy that Peter tried to kill, Jesus heals. Isn't that that way in the church sometimes? Well, that person there says, yeah, no, 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 no. And that's the person that Jesus loves. The person you hit. They have 37 demons, Bob. Well, go home and pray so that all the demons get cast out of them. Well, then I can't criticize them anymore. But if I say they have a lot of demons, then I can criticize them. But then, you're, then your faith will stop working. Think about AJ when he was on the train and that demon-possessed person started to charge him. His first response was, my righteousness will defend myself. But then he reverted into the kingdom response of the glory of God and of the righteousness of God and of the love of God. And that person was stopped. The demon, the demon in the person could not move forward because of the love of God. I'll tell you this interesting story. I wish I could remember the preacher's name, but it was, it was, um, it was somewhere in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, I just can't remember the preacher's name. But he was a preacher. He was a man of God. And he was in a field. And there was a, a bull in that same field. And he was kind of like, like kind of laying down or up against a tree. And this bull starts to charge toward him. <laughs> you know, bull with the horns, thousands of pounds, they kill you real easy. And he said, instead of getting up and running or... or natural thoughts he might have, climb a tree, anything. 
He said, he, the, he said, the presence of God just came on me. And he goes, I looked at that bull, and he says, I just felt compassion and love. He said, That's a, that, that bull is created by God. And, I, and he just thought, I love, I love you so much. He's thinking this because the glory of God's on him. And all he was doing is thinking about how much he loved that animal. I mean, we know that God loves every bit of his creation. How much he loved that animal. He loved him so much. And he said, and the bull just kept coming, but he just, the more the bull came, the more it's like, I love you. And he said that bull got really close to him, and it just stopped. The love of God is the divine order that the earth was created in. The earth was created in the order of the love of God. The earth and the heavens function in alignment with the love of God. So when you hear a message on, you need to love, you know, that's somebody telling you to love by your own ability and by your own righteousness. No. What we need is, we need to allow God to love us because just like Adam in the garden, when God would come in the day and he would speak to him, and then Adam would speak life into the earth. We are the only ones that can speak life into the earth. The angels can't do it. God, can, God himself doesn't have the authority because he gave it to us. So he has to speak to us, and that's what he did through Adam. He would come and speak to Adam, and then Adam would speak into the earth. But everything that God says is love. So when God wants to speak into the earth, he has to come through you, but anything he speaks through you is love, even if it's judgment. Even if, God's, even if God's speaking judgment and it's ferocious, it's still love. Faith works by love. When did he say that? He said that right after. He said, it's not by works, but by grace. And if you, if you take up the works and not the grace, you are fallen from the grace. Not circumcision or uncircumcision. Then he says, it's neither circumcision or uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. I think it's still up on the board. Yeah. Neither circumcision avails anything or uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. And that has mostly to do. That, that sixth verse is connected to the first five verses. It's all about the grace that God gives you that gives you righteousness. His grace gives you his righteousness so you can come into his presence and in his presence he can love you. And when he loves you, you take that love and you speak it into the earth. Greasy grace, Bob. <laughs> License to sit. No. It's not, there's no greasy grace. The grace of God gives you righteousness that brings you into the presence of God. God loves you. You in turn love the earth and you love everyone on the earth your words are love I'm going to finish with a story Some of you remember when A.A. Um, a. Allen's daughter, no, granddaughter, granddaughter, and her husband came here and preached. We're in a different building, but they came and they preached, and <clears throat> it was the most amazing testimony. And from what I understand, I was talking with somebody who was there that they never, they never told that story in any churches. They said only if a place is the, where the people are praying, they can handle it. But they told it here. And the story was about the daughter of Anton LaVey, who was the prince of darkness, like, like the head of the occult. This guy was in every part of the occult. And this was his daughter, uh, they were going to use her as a human sacrifice. 
And she grew up in witchcraft and, and everything you can think of. So she, she could see it. Here's the funny thing. A lot of times people in the occult can see more into the spirit realm than, than the Christians. She would stand with the pastor sometime when people were coming into the church and say, this person uh, has this spirits with them and this person. Is it. And, and the pastor, knew, knowing the people, said she was accurate 100% of the time. She could see these, these Christians had demons hanging around them. That, like, like, I don't, Bob, do I? Yeah, if you have an unrighteous consciousness, you do. There's a legalistic demon hanging around you trying to tell you how lousy you are and a terrible person you are, how worthless you are. Except if somebody says something bad about you, then you defend yourself by your own righteousness. <laughs> but this, this woman, she, they, tried to, had, they had tried to kill her. her. Her own daughter had tried to kill her. And um, she was in a big old neck brace and she, she was in a Benny Hinn meeting. And Benny Hinn called her out and said, you're going to go live with some pastors in Northern California. And he starts prophesying to her. Ten years before all this happened, this prophet came to these pastors and he said, something is coming and you guys have to get ready for it. He goes, you need to start getting ready now. Now they didn't. And he came uh, five years later, he saw me and the same thing like three or four times. Finally, like with six months before he got there, he said, I came here specifically for one reason to tell you, you have a very short time to get ready for what's coming. Now they weren't just going to be messing around with some low-level demons, you know. Anything. Get off my shoe. <laughs> but I like it down here. I like the concrete. Not those kind of demons. And so I forget all the circumstances how, but she ended up moving in with this couple. One of them being A. Allen's granddaughter. And she had a lot of demons, but she had she had been seeking Christ. And I believe that she had become a believer, but she still had a lot of demons. A believer can't have demons. Well, every, you can ask every believer I've cast demons out if that's true or not. You can have them in your soul, not your spirit. But she had a lot of demons. I mean a lot. And um, the main point I want to make to you is this. They said sometimes you start to manifest things and they would just operate in the love of God. And they didn't really even know that much about casting out demons. So they, they, they weren't ready. So they would, but when they operate in the love of God, she would calm down. But the wife came in one day, and she was really frustrated and upset about something. And Ray, Ray, LeVay started, she said something that upset her, and she went, ah! And she said she took her with one arm and threw her across, literally across the room. To think she was young, could take that kind of a pounding. And she knew immediately she had to get back into love right away. And she did. And she said any time that they got out of love, the demons would have, they would, they would be able to work outside of the love of God. So all the times you've ever gotten out of the love of God and justified yourself for doing it, well, I had a right to do that. The demons, the demons, they got you. They had you where they wanted you. And they wanted you to not walk in love. They wanted you to get upset. They wanted you to hate somebody because faith works by love. Bob, we can all get upset. Of course we can. And what do you do? You know, I used to have, I used to have a little bit of a temper. I know it's hard to believe because I'm so sweet. <laughs> but anybody that knows me for a long time knows that. You know, Randy, I usually don't let Randy tell the story. He was telling it in the office when I said, don't tell that story, Randy. We were driving somewhere. This was many, many years ago. And somebody did something to us in a car, and the car stopped, and Randy said he looked over, and he said, I was out the door on the way to the car. What are you doing, Pastor Bob? <laughs> Going to have a word with these folks. <laughs> he 
What was that? Well, there is an, there is an Irish spirit. <laughs> oh, no, there really is. There's an Irish spirit. You know, they talk about the fighting Irish, but if you go to Ireland, they're the nicest people in the world. You go, oh, these people wouldn't harm any. They're so nice. They're so sweet. But if something throws you off. I would just, uh, even when I was young, I would get so mad. But this guy was supposed to be one of the toughest guys in the school, and he was, he was sitting behind me in a chair, and he was doing something on my back, and I just, that thing went off, and I turned around, and I said, I said, I'm just like this with fear. I said, you touch me again, I'm going to break your big fat nose. And he just, <laughs> he's supposed to be this tough guy, but when he saw that fury, he was like, I, I don't want to mess with that idiot. <laughs> I'm telling you, the thing would come upon me, there was a spirit. A uh, church member, many years later, he goes, I remember you from high school, Bob. He goes, yeah, you were standing up on this place. There were six of us, and you were, you were drunk or high or something. You were cursing and swearing. You threatened to kill all of us. <laughs> <laughs> he says, you started coming at us, and we all ran. <laughs> so who is that? I don't know that person. When I say that, I would be scared of that person, but I don't know that person. I don't know that person because that person is gone. And I remember when it started to happen because there was, there was a, somebody had done a casting call and they, without me knowing, a friend of my wife's and all of these people were lined up around our block and they were parking and none of the neighbors knew and people were sitting on the lawn and, and, and I'm just like, what's going on here? Oh, they're doing a casting call. And I remember this guy puts out a folding chair and he puts it on my front lawn. And I remember I walked over and I, and I, mean, I, just, I just let him have it. I yelled at everybody in the line. Yeah! And I told them what, to, what for and what. And <laughs> there it was like this. And the person said, oh, Bob, we're so sorry. And then my daughter goes, Dad, go back in your office and don't come out in the front yard. <laughs> so what did you do, Bob? You know, I went into the Holy Ghost because I did recognize it was there, even though it was getting less, but I recognized it was there. I went into the Holy Ghost and I remember just praying, praying it through to where there was in some situation where I might have got a little bit angry and I was just, I had total peace and total calm. I've never had that rage come on me again. In Ireland, there was a leader called Cacullin, and when they would go into war, like they, they, they fought so ferociously against the British, the British couldn't conquer them. But what would happen is they would, they would be just like a normal person, and they'd, get, they'd, they'd start to work themselves up, and they'd get this to where they looked like crazy, like, they'd like, like they didn't even look human. And when they, they would attack the Romans, one guy would run and take the spear just so the other guy could kill him. Like they didn't care if they got hurt. And I remember that feeling. When I would get that way, I didn't care if I got hurt. It's just all I could think about is I want to hurt you. And I had to recognize it was a demonic spirit. Now, it didn't manifest very often. I was loving most of the time. Like I'm going to say 97.5% of the time I was loving and kind. But every once in a while, because I had never dealt with it, I mean, you were a pastor for many years and you never, you were healing the sick and everything, all kinds of miracles and, and, and I had to deal with it. But when I dealt with it, it has never, ever risen up again. And I remember hearing Smith Wigglesworth, he had a bad temper and he said one time he just took dominion over it and he never had that temper again. So when we justify not loving somebody, they did this to me, they made me mad. I'm not, like, if somebody comes up and kicks you in the shin, I'm not saying you're going to go, oh, thank you. You know, you might go, oh, what are you doing? You know, you might, you might have a little short burst of anger, but you can reel it in. Because why? Because you've broken that thing. Now, I'm just talking from the culture I came from. Other cultures have, you know, other, other ways of, of not loving, all taught by demons. But whatever it is in whatever culture you came up in, we're in a different culture now. We're in the culture of Christ. Yeah. And, and listen to me. It's hard for me to tell those stories I just told you. It's really hard for me to, because I am such a nice person and I am a good person. I would never hurt anybody. 
I really wouldn't. What are you laughing at, Veronica? <laughs> No, it's really the truth. It's hard for me to tell it, but I, I felt like I had to expose truth about my own life, you know, where I, I had issues. And, um, and they, were, they were bad issues. You know, it wasn't just me. And my, my dad fought all the time when he was a kid, you know. He was a tough, he got, this guy was quick as lightning, and he fought a gang by himself. And his brother, brother fought a gang by himself. You know, and these guys were like nuts. And, and I met my dad's... Uh, um, mother, sister, and she was 90 or something. She was all spunky and ready to fight. You know, like, like wow. <laughs> but like I said, 97% of the time I was fine, but, but that spirit had never been fully dealt with. So what does that mean? That means that it might have affected other things in my life that I wasn't even aware of. And so <laughs> any time that you step out of the love of God. You're opening up yourself to an unclean spirit. So let the love of God overwhelm you, overtake you. Let God love you. His love in you. And His love in you will drive out fear. You will not be afraid. So that one woman, when she pulled a gun on me, she had, that, she had the look in her eye, I knew the crazy look. Like, I had no fear at all. Why? Because I didn't hate her and I wasn't angry with her. I was so calm, she made her nervous. She's like, why wasn't I afraid? I'm not afraid. If I'm in the flesh, maybe I'm afraid. But I wasn't afraid. The love of God, the last story, I thought it was going to be short and the hair went long. When I was in Bible school, there was a series by Kenneth Copeland on the love of God. And um, I know there's a lot of people taking pot shots in him, but I think he's done a lot of good for the body of Christ. Amen. Just tell you that. But he had a series on the love of God, and so I listened to each tape that he had. It's like when they had tapes. <clears throat> I listened to each tape like 30 times. Because you hear something once, you don't really get it. So I listened to each one like 30 times, and I think it was on like the third tape, and I was just constantly listening to these messages on the love of God and going to Bible school. So I remember this one friend of mine, say she was an ex-girlfriend, she was mad at me about something. You know, it wasn't unusual. And um, at that particular time, I just, I just was speaking love and speaking kindly. <laughs> and she just took her hand and she went. And, I mean, listen, she just took her hand and went. And her hand stopped. She couldn't hit me. And she, she's like, she was also in Bible school. <laughs> A wonderful Christian. <laughs> so she tried it again. She went. And I, I didn't. You know, I didn't put my hand up to block it or anything. I just, I love you. And she couldn't hit me. Now, if somebody comes up to, you know, punch you, I'm not, you know, unless you're really in that. And I was taking a chance on that one. She couldn't hit me. And, and she tried like two or three times. And finally she said, man, the love of God's really powerful. I was thinking, thank God. <laughs> but, you know, there, there were times I let that slip, like anybody. But I believe that if we really take hold of righteousness, and really, it's really about letting God love you. There were two weeks I taught on that message on letting God love you. And um, right after that, the next week, Bill Yount came in. And it was just, um, it was through a friend said, hey, Bob, you ever heard of a guy named Bill Yao? And I said, yeah, I know he's a, a prophet. He's a, on Elijah list. Um, <clears throat> she said, he's going to be in California. You, you think you have an opening? I said, we'll make an opening. And so he came here, and what did he teach on? Taught on the love of God and letting God love you. 
to me, that was God speaking to us and confirming to us that our, our congregation is a congregation of love. Amen. That no matter who you're talking to in this place, you love them. Whoever walks through these doors, and not just through these doors, wherever you are, I don't care if you're at the gas station, anywhere, love people. Let the love of God, let God love you. And we're doing, during the worship time, don't just worship God. Let God love you. Worship is, worship is not just you as a slave saying, Oh, great master, I obey you. Worship is you intermingling with him, allowing his presence to intermingle with you and you intermingling back with him. All right. That's enough. I went so long, I'm not going to... Amen. Thank you. I went so long, I'm not going to read any scriptures for the offering. Um, But we are going to receive the offering at this time. And if if the Lord touched you in any way, if you got revelation from this, then um, give into that revelation as the Lord would direct you and... um, if you're making out checks, of course, please make them out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries. And uh, we have the text on the board. If you're texting in, if you're at home watching on our website, <clears throat> it will tell you how to give. If you're watching somewhere else, go to our website. We'll show you how to give. Just out of curiosity while you're doing that, how many of you just feel like, I feel like I know God loves me a little bit more than I thought before I walked in today? Quite a few of you. The rest of you are all liars. So. <laughs> what, Bob, why did you say that? So I wanted to test the love, see how much you still love me. <laughs> oh, my. All right, let's pray. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I'm so in awe of you that you are love absolute. That when you were on the cross, the thing that kept you going, that you saw me, everything you did, you did because you wanted me. You loved me so much. I thank you for loving me. And I love you because you first loved me. And as we come into the presence of our Father, I'm asking you as my high priest to present my tithes and offerings unto the Father as a sweet savor, as an offering in righteousness. And Father, we do humble ourselves to remind you of the promises in Malachi 3. I prove you in this way. I receive the opening of the windows of heaven into our modern day life. And I receive the rebuking of the devourer for our sakes. I thank you, Father that a complete transformation is happening in our nation. That you're transforming our nation in every way. We thank you for transforming our schools. Transforming our political system. Transforming our financial system. I thank you, Father, that we are living in the time of transformation. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, ushers. And I'm going to say this to you, that we are living in the time of financial and political transformation of this nation. All the Christians that have been praying in the United States of America and even around the world, God has heard the prayers You know, it says sometimes he will 
he will hold back his hand like he did with Pharaoh for a season that he might show his glory. I believe we're going to see the glory of the Lord in our nation coming. And I believe it's already started. I believe the beginning has already started. And not only that, we're going to see the financial transformation. And people would say, no, God needs to judge America. But he has been judging. He's been judging the darkness in America. Let me just tell you how God judges things. God looks at darkness and he says, I cannot allow this to continue. And so he judges the darkness. If people in the darkness hold on to the darkness, they get judged with it. But if they let go of the darkness, they don't get judged with it. Sodom and Gomorrah is a perfect example. They were dark, dark places, and they were going to infect everywhere else. They were going to spread. And so God came to Abraham and said, I'm judging those places. And it's even different than it is now because they couldn't get born again. They couldn't change their spirits. He said, I'm judging that place. And Abraham so what if there's 50 righteous? I won't judge it. So Abraham interceded, and he got down to 10. Now that's where we can do. Our intercession can spare a lot of people that should be judged in the darkness, spares them into a place of repentance over the grace of God or a visitation from God. But Abraham interceded. He was a prophet intercessor, and he interceded. So was Enoch, by the way the prophet intercessor. But he interceded, and God said, I won't destroy them if there's 10. But there wasn't even 10 righteous people. He knew that Lot was there with his family, figured there got to be a few more, but there wasn't. So what did the Lord do? He went and he got Lot and his family. And he said, don't turn back. So the angels, literally Lot, Lot was hesitating and waiting, and, and they finally said, we, we can't bring judgment until we get you out of here. So they got him out of there, and Lot's wife turns back, and she was judged with the darkness. Had she not turned back, she was delivered from the darkness, but she turned back to the darkness, and she got judged with the darkness. Uh, so when judgment comes, and you're going to see a lot of judgment, you're going to see a lot of judgment in a lot of places, pray for those people Pray for those people that there will be repentance, that there will be grace for them to repent. And, um, and I believe that God will spare them. And I want it, I mean, I, I, like some of you go, I want them to be judged, you know. I, I, I mean, so there's some people you just, you look at them and you go, you go, man, they annoy me. I, I'm kind of glad they got judged. Listen, when I, when I spoke that thing about Alec Baldwin that time, there were people, some people were mad at me, but the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, write, a, write an email. Not such a smart aleck now. And just how that he had, the Lord told me, he said, I lifted my grace from him. He said, I did not do this. I didn't cause the shooting. He goes, but I lifted my grace from him. And if you see, he's in the news all the time for doing something stupid. Why? The grace of God is completely lifted from that guy. But he said, the Holy Spirit said, it's not only him, but there are many, many people who had attacked 45 he goes, they will be judged. And we saw a lot of that since that article. And I'm not saying I'm definitely not the only one that said it. Probably a lot of other people, I'm sure, prophesied that. But you look at all, the, all those reporters in CNN that got fired and, or that got, that got brought to justice for sexual abuse and pedophilia. I mean, these, these were people running the networks were pedophiles. And, and even, the, even the governor of New York and his brother so you see a lot of judgment that came because they had embraced the darkness and they didn't repent. Well, they're still alive, so they still could repent. And if they repent, they could actually be restored, Amen. believe it or not. Say, so, no, no, they can, no, if they repent, cry out to God, they could be restored because God loves them so much. All right, let's stand up. If anybody needs healing today, say, I just, I need healing or some restoration or just... Say, I need somebody to agree with me in prayer about something. That's what these guys are up here for. They're up here to pray with you or pray for you. 
If it's healing, just to lay hands. The Bible says lay hands on the sick. And I, listen, I believe that there is another level of healing I know is being revealed to me. I had an interesting thing happen to me last week. Something in my right knee went out. And I, I couldn't put weight on or I couldn't put pressure. And like I put pressure and it just, it was just off. So um, I started speaking Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter. And, but I did something a little different. I didn't ask God for anything because he's already given it. I just, I said, Lord, I remind you of the healing anointing that you released through Jesus by the stripes on his back. And I literally just saw Jesus with the stripes on his back. And I said, I receive that anointing into my body and I receive it into my right knee. And I received it. And then I would quote those scriptures multiple times during that day. I received it and then I woke up the next day and it was exactly the same. So I just kept doing that. But about... Midway through the day, it just changed. It was healed. So what did you do? Well, I went and took a 30-minute walk. And then I just kept speaking to my leg, but to my body as well. And um, Thursday, no, was it Thursday? Friday. In the morning before we prayed, I thought, I'm going to take a little walk over to the park. And I always set my, always set my timer you know, to know how long or what distance. And I was going to go maybe for five or eight minutes or something, just a short walk. But my legs felt so good. It wasn't just my knee was healed. My legs felt so good, I just kept going. And, <laughs> and then my watch dinged, and I, I had walked a mile. And um, I never try to walk fast. I just walk at a pace that I enjoy. But I noticed that it was the fastest mile I had done this year by over two minutes faster. My legs felt so good and so loose. It was not just healing, but like restoration. And the interesting thing is, when I walk here, I always walk slower here. I don't know why than when I'm at home. But this was the fastest by two minutes. Something had happened in my legs. There had been some kind of a restoration. I wasn't trying to walk fast. They just felt like good and energy. How did your knee feel? It handled it. I ended up walking two more miles that day. Just different times. I said, I'm going to go for a five-minute walk. And, and I was a mile. What happened? Healing, anointing. We're not asking God. He said, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Somebody lays hands on you, you receive the healing anointing. Say, I receive it into my body. Whatever part of your body it is. I wasn't going to tell that testimony today, but as, as I was thinking about not telling it, the Lord reminded me of something that Kenneth Hagin had, used to teach. Oh, I didn't even remember what it is, but there were three things, and one of them was you testify. So I'm, you were, what were you healed from? Your heart, that's right. So her heart was healed last week when we prayed. That's awesome. Testify. Okay. So if you do need healing, Rodney, let's play, sing that again. We're going to sing it one more time, and I'm going to invite you to come on up. And if you guys up here feel like you feel like an anointing on you for something, somebody's shoulder, whatever, just wave at me, and then we'll call it out. Father, I thank you that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you've sent it to do. And I pray for the healing anointing to come upon everyone that's watching. I don't care if you have arthritis in your hands, your hips, or your knees. I just heard arthritis. God is healing arthritis right now. I just declare healing anointing over arthritis. Anyone who's watching, I declare the healing anointing upon you. By the stripes of Jesus, I declare that you are healed. We release his love and his healing to you. Father, I pray that your healing mercies would go into every house at the sound of my voice, not only live but even recorded. Watch it later. Let your healing and glory come in and touch everybody. And we receive it done, Father. 
And I pray, Lord, that your grace would be upon everyone this week, that your kingdom, your righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit would be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are done. God bless you. Love you. Take time to talk to somebody and tell them you love them and you appreciate them. And we will see you Thursday.